It's the first day of COVID-19 antigen rapid tests at land checkpoints for cargo drivers. We'll speak to one supplier about how it's going. Tomorrow marks a year to the date Singapore confirmed its first case of COVID-19. What are the lessons learned so far and what can we do better? There was a lot of unknown and clearly if we have a better picture, then we you know, will have taken different measures. And the sky is the limit. Despite the pandemic, sales of HDB resale flats hit an eight-year high in 2020. Welcome to The Big Story, coming to you live from The Straits Times Newsroom. I'm Olivia Kuei. I'm Harian Tudiman. You can subscribe to The Straits Times channel so you never miss a single episode. 15 new COVID-19 cases were confirmed today, including one in the community. The remaining 14 were imported and had already been placed on stay-home notice or isolated when they arrived in Singapore. More details will be released later tonight. It's the first day the compulsory antigen rapid test is being carried out at the land checkpoints. From today, cargo drivers and those accompanying them who enter Singapore will have to undergo the test at the Tuas and Woodlands checkpoints. Not all will be tested in the initial stage. Selection is random for now, but in the coming weeks, all motorists will undergo the test. Well, let's take a look at the testing process. Uh, when a driver arrives at the Woodlands checkpoint, he or she will first take the test before proceeding to clear immigration. Subsequently, the driver will then collect the transported items. Now, the driver can only continue on the journey into Singapore when the test result comes back negative. Well, the process is similar at the Tuas checkpoint, except that the driver will clear immigration first before taking the test. This compulsory ART affects cargo drivers who bring in, among, among other things, fresh produce like live chickens. So how have cargo drivers been affected? Now, to answer this, we have James Sim with us. He's the head of business development at chicken supplier Key Song. James for a start, uh, what feedback do you receive from your drivers? Uh, was delivery delayed because of the test? Plus, they have to wait about 30 minutes for the results. Um, today is day one, so I think everything is still uh, trying to get a flow moving. Uh, from our driver, they told us that uh, there's a slight delay. It's about an hour or two uh, mm. because of all the message jam going on and all the works and processes. Uh, versus the day before that, it's about and our each to do this period right now is the Chinese New Year. Uh, so there's more traffic and more more activities going on along the causeway. Uh, we're just hoping that the, the, the time delay can be controlled. And um, you know, if there's a if there's a speed lane coming up, they can let these uh, live um, chickens being passed through in a, in a timely manner that will benefit us. James, could you briefly tell us the day-to-day -day process for your cargo truck drivers you know, who come through Singapore's land checkpoints? Do they come into contact with other personnel, for instance? Um, ours, uh, our truck, um, they're all live chicken, first of all. And um, there are regulations checked uh, at a custom checkpoint on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, random check by the SFA officer. Uh, we'll make sure that everything is good, uh, the life chicken is not sick. Uh, yeah, I know uh, drugs and antibiotics being, being abused to, to this uh, live chicken. Uh, once that is cleared and everything, we will um, hand over the checkpoint. Uh, with this test coming, um, it's something new. Uh, we are still trying to adapt to it. Uh, James, what are some pros and cons uh, that this compulsory antigen rapid test on Kisong's supply chain? Uh, this test comes in a timely manner with the number of cases uh, um, spiking up globally. I think uh, it's a good move by, by the government side of to ensure that all the food safety uh, from the product itself, from the chicken itself, as far well as the consumer uh, getting uh, the safe choice of products. And also, uh, it's also acts as a, um, uh, a benefit in terms of interactions between people from the drivers and our um, customer officers uh, that is working and that's deal with the customer side. Right. Well, thanks so much for sharing that, James. We've been speaking mm -hmm. to James Sim, Business Development Head at Kisong Food Corporation.
In other local news, NTUC Fair Price Group CEO Xia Kian Ping said today that there are plans in place to mitigate any potential delays in deliveries that may come with the new compulsory testing of cargo drivers. They include diversifying sources of supply and building up enough supplies. With the pandemic delaying housing projects because of labour and supply shortages, 194 families have requested for interim rental housing from HDB. Of this, 131 households are already living in their rental units and 39 households will be moving in or getting their units soon. The remaining 24 households withdrew their requests for the units. Well, meanwhile, sales of HDB resale flats reached an eight-year high in 2020 with the number of resale transactions up 4.4%. Meanwhile, prices of these flats rose for a third consecutive quarter, climbing 3.1% in the last three months of 2020 compared with the previous quarter. A property analyst said the rise in prices was unexpected against the economic crisis brought on by COVID-19 as well as a growing supply of HDB flats. Tomorrow, January 23rd, marks a year since Singapore reported its first COVID-19 case. Co-chairs of the Multi-Ministry Task Force, Health Minister Gan Kim Yong and Education Minister Lawrence Wong, reflect on Singapore's efforts against the pandemic in the past year. Welcome to this uh, press conference. We are not at the end of the tunnel yet. Uh, the war is not yet over. We need to continue to remain uh, vigilant. Even now, we still have a very limited knowledge about the virus. From now till perhaps one year, maybe one and a half years from now, I don't expect major changes. We will largely still be in the midst of a pandemic. Because even if the majority of people in Singapore are vaccinated, it's impossible for the world to be vaccinated by this year. Over a four-year time frame, five years, who knows exactly when, but at some point the pandemic will pass. Surely, no pandemic is forever. Either the world gets vaccinated and achieves herd immunity, or the virus attenuates and it's no longer as deadly. How long that will take, I don't know but it's not going to be within a year. Of course, the biggest decision was the circuit breaker and how we arrive at the, uh, the timing of the circuit breaker. If you do it too soon, it's not going to be effective. If you do it too late, uh, it's also not going to help because you would have already have a big cluster in your hands. So we have to persuade the cabinet, persuade PM, so if this is a time that we need to move, and we need to move in a quite a decisive way. Because the worst is to have a, a half-measured circuit breaker. Then we would have gone through the difficulty, but yet it's not going to be effective. Communicating to the public the necessity for the measures amidst this whole environment where it's so easy for people to get caught up in the latest mood, whatever that mood is, is extremely challenging. We all know that the mood shifts quite quickly and is quite volatile. Yes, we certainly have to take into account public opinion and feedback, but it ultimately has to be based on scientific evidence, data, expert opinion, and then to explain that to the public and get support for the measures. I think that's, that's to me, one of the biggest challenges so far. We knew that the decision to go into a circuit breaker is a difficult one, but how to emerge from circuit breaker is an even tougher one. The whole idea of phase three is to allow us to achieve a more or less sustainable steady state situation while waiting for vaccine to be propagated or for the world's uh, uh, infection to come down before we are able to revert more or less to the normal. That will take some time because it's not just Singapore, it's the rest of the world. So it's not so easy for us to uh, just simply open up. Even after we have all been vaccinated, international traveling could still be challenging because other countries may not be opening. So in terms of international traveling, is something that we need to look at what the rest of the world is, uh, is doing and what's happening in 
overall global landscape before we are able to make uh, major changes. There are certainly many things we can do better if you look back. At the start of the year when we were fighting this virus, there are so much uncertainty, so many things we didn't know about the virus. We didn't know about the asymptomatic nature of transmission. We didn't know how infectious it was. There was a lot of unknown and clearly if we have a better picture, then we'll have taken different measures. After all this is over, we, as we have promised, we will do a full review really to look at how our processes, our systems can be improved because we know that there will be future pandemics. And just as we have learned from SARS, we have improved our system. After COVID-19, we want to learn from this experience to uh, do even better and be better prepared for the next pandemic and for disease X in the future. You can watch the full video on The Straits Times' YouTube channel. Well, in a special tomorrow across our print and digital platforms, The Straits Times will be looking at the key milestones of our COVID-19 fight in the past year. And of course, news editor Karamjit Kaur is here to share more. Welcome, Karam. So there's so much to cover in that one year. What did the team choose to cover and how do you come to the decisions, especially considering you need to present it in the best way possible for our readers and our viewers? Yes. Um, so... Uh, we thought, uh, you know, long and hard about how we wanted to do this. One year, you know, we, we marked one year of the first uh, reported case here in Singapore. That was on Jan 23rd uh, last year, of course. Seems like a lifetime uh, ago for many people. Um, and so we said and, we, you know, we sort of thought, what, what really would people remember ab about this last one year? And really, as you mentioned, Olivia, so many things. But when you talk about the key milestones, I think a few things really stand out. Um, first, of course, you know, the day the first uh, case was reported here in Singapore on Jan 23rd, uh, and that was a 66-year-old uh, man who had come from uh, Wuhan in China. Um, after that, you know, we reported um, the first COVID death, uh, uh, you know, um, an elderly person, and that then, you know, trust the whole focus and uh, conversation uh, to basically talk about how vulnerable our seniors are to COVID-19 and why it's so important to protect them uh, from, from this virus and the disease as well. And then the next um, really a key milestone was March 23rd when Singapore shut uh, it, you know, its borders. Um, and that really was a significant, significant moment given our status as an international hub with such an open mm. city, you know, a major financial hub. And I think uh, brought a lot of uh, problems for the entire aviation tourism mm. sector. And of course, for Singaporeans and residents, uh, Circuit Breaker, I think, was that one um, defining moment for many people. Since then, of course, you know, we've gone to phase one, um, we've gone to phase two, um, we're now in phase three. and. You know, I don't think you can talk about phase two without talking about the Singapore-Hong Kong yeah. air travel bubble. I mean, that uh, created, I think, some optimism in, mm. uh, you know, in uh, Singaporeans, uh, Singapore residents, because everyone loved to travel so much. And then, you know, of course, just before that flight, that bubble was burst. Yeah. I think that uh, uh, brought a lot of uh, sadness and <laughs> to disappointment and too. disappointment, yeah, for uh, many people. And then that story has now turned to hope because now we've got um, the vaccines and. Uh, you know, we've started uh, uh, getting uh, people here inoculated, uh, healthcare workers, you know, others in the front line, uh, uh, officers from the Ministry of Health. And so we're now right really in the middle of this uh, whole process. And um, like I said, that's brought a lot of hope. Uh, but really, I think this battle, as, as they keep saying repeatedly, uh, it's far mm. from um, over, you know. And you asked Olivia about how we decided to present this. Mm. Um, so we thought, you know, we'll do it in the, in the form of like a, a graphic, you know, just really looking at the milestones in terms of the dates. And mm. uh, we also wanted to make it very visual, heavy, um, you know, to, to run a lot of pictures so that, you know, people sort of remember this is where, you know, we were, this is where we came from, this is where we are today. And, and we felt that it was a very powerful tool to, to, to really tell people this, you know, let's stop, reflect. And now I think it's really even more significant because, you know, we are unfortunately seeing you know, an increase in number of uh, cases and local clusters, which is alarming. Um, so, you know, good to tell people that, you know, yes, we've come so far, but, you know, let's not be complacent. Yeah. Mm. Karm, on that, you know, big key moments, of course, you've mentioned, mentioned, but at the core of this pandemic are the people uh, who are infected. And so tomorrow's special, we understand, will also include the profile of a former patient. Right, absolutely, yeah. Um, 
it, it's all about people, right? And uh, you know, in Singapore, we've had uh, over uh, 59,000 uh, people who've been infected with COVID-19 already so far. So uh, yes, my uh, colleague uh, Joyce Tio, she uh, caught up with one of the early uh, patients, uh, Mr. Ben Ng. Uh, now he got uh, infected sometime in March. Um, and so she caught up with him recently. And you know, after so many months, he still uh, has flashbacks of his time in ICU, he uh, spent quite a bit of time there, really, you know, literally fighting for his life. And really, um, we want to tell the story of, you know, what's transpired in Singapore through his eyes. And so, you know, there was a time when, you know, um, Singaporeans, there was this whole panic buying, which I think a lot of people are never going to forget, you know, for a long time to come, you know, people rushing to get toilet paper. Uh, Shelves clearing out, exactly, yeah. Exactly, instant noodles and all that. Uh, but I think also more importantly, that then uh, took the whole national conversation towards uh, the whole supply chain process, you know. It uh, sort of pushed, I think, the whole move to be self-sufficient in terms of uh, food supplies, for example. Um, and then also, um, you know, beyond that, as, as we then sort of tell the story through his eyes, and then now we're in the state where we're getting all the vaccines in, and that then has also uh, taken the conversation to our logistics, uh, you know, sector, for example. You know, it's a massive operations, not just in Singapore, but globally to transport all these vaccines. Uh, so, so that, that sort of um, also is another important story to tell. Uh, so we've put this package together, and we hope, you know, it, um, our readers will... Um, you know, read it and hopefully, you know, uh, go away with some tips and I think more importantly with some hope for the future as well. Yep. Mm. well certainly very exciting to uh, read that coming out yep. in our papers as well as on our digital platforms also on our website. Well, thank you so much, Karim, for coming on to the show to speak with us. Uh, that was Karim Jitkor, News Editor for The Straits Times. Again, like we mentioned earlier, and of course, uh, Karim mentioned as well, be sure to look out for this special tomorrow in the paper and on our website. In global news, U.S. President Joe Biden signed 10 new executive orders to slow the spread of the coronavirus. His plan includes mounting an aggressive vaccination campaign, mandating masks on interstate travel and international travelers to quarantine, equipping schools to reopen safely as well as boosting testing, and to address the shortages of personal protective equipment and other items and materials needed for testing and vaccinations. Mr. Biden invoked the Defense Production Act. This allows the government to mobilize companies to prioritize producing the necessary equipment. Meanwhile, U.S. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer is reviewing a request from Republicans to postpone the start of Donald Trump's impeachment trial until mid-February. Republicans argued that Mr. Trump would need time to gather his defense against the charges of inciting an insurrection. Democrats say the House could send the impeachment charge to the Senate as early as today, but Senate leader Republican leader Mitch McConnell had asked the Democrats to hold off until January 28th and then give Mr Trump two weeks from that day to prepare a defence. Japan's cabinet today approved draft laws to toughen COVID-19 restrictions. The new laws would allow the authorities to punish and even imprison people for up to a year if they test positive but refuse hospitalization. They would also penalize bars and restaurants that continue evening service with fines of up to 500,000 yen. The bills are expected to pass parliament next week, but reports said the opposition will push for an amendment to the section on forced hospitalization following criticism that it impinges on civil liberties. Meanwhile, a government spokesperson has denied an earlier newspaper report about the possible cancellation of the Tokyo Olympics. And in sports, FIFA said players who feature in the breakaway European Super League will be banned from playing in FIFA competitions, including the World Cup. In a joint statement with UEFA and the other five continental confederations, World Football's governing body said it would not recognise any such breakaway. The idea of a breakaway league is an alternative to UEFA's Champions League. It's been floated for many years, but speculation has intensified in the past two years. Well, those are our top stories for today. For more news and videos, visit straightstimes.com and subscribe to our YouTube channel by hitting the red button below. Once again, I'm Harianto Diman with Olivia Kuei. See you next week on The Big Story and have a great weekend.